session to begin with. This text here from Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. Well, you know it's not new because it's in the Bible. But it dawned on me this past week in preparing for today that I've never ever preached on this text. Ever. Never ever. Never ever. Never ever. Never ever. <laughs> and I thought I had done all. <laughs> I've read it before. I've heard it before. And had to preach from it before. And so it brought some new challenges to my own thinking. And hopefully it will do the same for you. That is why you came today, right? Amen. To be challenged. Amen. I mean, just a ski taste. Just challenge, just a ski taste. We're not going to turn you upside down and shake you or anything, but just to challenge you, just a little ski taste. Because this, 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 hmm. It works me. Amen. It works me. Thinking of Jesus telling this story. Like, why would Jesus, I mean, Jesus told some stories, y'all. Yes. But why would he choose to tell this story? I mean, he told several stories right here between Luke 13 and, and Luke 17. He tells, I think, about five stories about rich men. Different versions of different uh, manifestations of rich, rich people and rich men and banquets and and all this, this kind of thing. And, and so it's like, okay, he's trying to teach us something. But in this story, he talks about this rich man who lives a rather lavish life. And he puts him up against this poor man named Lazarus. Now, this is not the Lazarus who's raised from the dead. This is not the Lazarus who is the brother of uh, Mary and Martha. It's just somebody made up named Lazarus. Jesus is just making up stories. <laughs> kind of like you do sometimes. You know how you make up stories. Okay? But he has had a point. <laughs> Some of the ones you make up don't really have a point. <laughs> You know, to make you feel good or look good or something like that. But Jesus is trying to teach, teach something here. So, so he makes up this story and he shares with them. And he, he juxtaposes this, this rich man against this poor man. And this poor man's name is Lazarus. And did you catch what's happening with Lazarus? Not only is he poor, but he's lying outside the gate of the rich man. He's lying outside the gate of the rich man, and he's sick. He's so sick. How sick is he? I know. He's so sick that even the dogs. That's what the, it's translated as even the dogs, which means that dogs weren't the only ones who came and licked his sores. It didn't say only the dogs, or just the dogs, or the dogs. It says even the dogs. Do you know how long you have to just lie somewhere? And how still you have to be? Do you know how stuck in that situation you have to be? For something to have the wherewithal and the time to lick your souls. Now y'all looking at me, Jesus told a story. <laughs> Jesus told this whole nasty story. I didn't make this up. I wouldn't have told it this way. That's what he did. Now you looking at me all cross eyed. I didn't come up with this. But look at what happened. Lazarus dies, the poor man Lazarus dies, and the angel takes 
Lazarus away. And the scripture says, the rich man dies and he's buried. And he lifts up his eyes in this place that has a whole lot of flames and it's hot. Y'all have a name for that place? <laughs> Y'all ever heard of a place like that? Where it's bad and it's hot and it's flames? You know in Alabama they told us that was hell. They didn't teach y'all that in California? Y'all were talking about hell in California? It just seemed like that here already. So you have to stretch your imagination. <laughs> But I tell them at 745, since they, they didn't seem to understand the concept of hell, that, you know, we just go, our next series is just going to be, we're going to put it on the marquee, get the hell out of here, you know, put it on the marquee, see if we draw crap, you know, so we just do a whole series on him. But, but the, the, the rich man lifts up his eyes in this, this place of torment, and he can see Lazarus in this other place, and Lazarus must have been in a good place or a better place because he sees him there with Father Abraham. And to a good Jewish person, that's heaven. To be wherever Abraham is, that, that, would, that would be heaven. Or something heavenly. Right? And then, they have this conversation. The rich man in Hagar wants to have a conversation with Lazarus and Father Abraham. <sighs> this text really challenged me. There was this quote, John Wesley apparently preached on this sermon at some point in his life, and this quote from John Wesley's sermon on this text from Luke 16 says, It is no more sinful to be rich than to be poor. But it is dangerous beyond expression. Therefore, I remind all of you that are of this number, that have the conveniences of life, and something over that you walk upon slippery ground. You continually tread on snares and deaths. You are every moment on the verge of hell. That's what John Wesley said. And as we think about this text, we think about this story that Jesus shares and, and think about it, we, we, in our own times, we have the rich and we have the poor. And it seems that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The growing reality of in, income inequality seems to be the norm. Seems to be just what we're going to be stuck with for a while. And you, those of you who were here last week and you heard our council member share, he named a startling statistic that black women earn 63 cents to every white man's dollar. Are you looking at me again? He said, yeah, I'm just repeating <laughs> what he said. But with that math, that means that black women are always 37 cents short of a dollar. $37 shy of a hundred. $370 shy of a thousand. $3,700 shy of ten thousand. Thirty-seven thousand shy of a hundred thousand. Three hundred and seventy thousand shy of a million. And you wonder why you can't get ahead. You can't get your head above water. You wonder why your children are still living in your house at 30 and 40. Well, this economy is set up to keep them there. Could be where you raised them too, but I'm not going to put it on the economy. But, I mean, here's the upside. If they're still there at 40, there's no need for them to leave now. It'll be time for them to move back in and take care of you. Man, they see so so bye bye. That's just ten years you gotta deal with it. Let it out. But it's not only the economy of money that sets some behind. It's unchecked and 
and unchallenged systems of oppression and suppression that permeate our cultures and structures that hold many individuals, families, and communities in bondage. That's our problem. The statistics of the growing homeless population in L.A. County are startling. It's at an event not too long ago when Jan Perry was talking about homelessness in, in L.A. County, and she named the statistic that said that 90% of the population on Skid Row are African American men. 90% of the Skid Row population, African American men. You add that to the prison population that claims so many. And where the NAACP in its latest report says that African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites. The imprisonment rate for African American women is twice that of white women. Nationwide, African American children represent 32% of children who are arrested, 42% of children who are detained, and 52% of children whose cases are judicially weighed to criminal courts. Children. And we haven't even gotten into wrongful convictions, mass criminalization, and the role that white supremacy plays in our society and in our psyche. We haven't even gotten there. See what happens when we stumble upon a scripture I haven't preached on before? <laughs> I haven't had 20 years to make it nice. But it all comes back to this. And it may not be you, and it may not be yours today. But we must be careful. Because whenever we start to think that we have made it, and our sense of making it is based on a comparison that we are able to draw based on someone else's state of being, we've only made ourselves believe that we're better off than someone else. We've only made ourselves believe it. And that's not a sound approach to life. And I don't believe it is well either when we compare ourselves to other people. Your status and standards have to be based on whether or not you have been faithful, whether or not you've been fruitful. Not on whether or not you've been more or less fruitful or faithful than someone else. But you have to take your own inventory. Amen. Each person has a life to live and a testimony to unfold. None of us begin in the same place and we don't, do not have the same opportunities, even if they appear to be the same. In this text in Luke 16, Jesus tells the biblical version of what we have going on today. There's the rich man who dines more than sufficiently all day, every day, while just outside the gate, within his purview, there lies this man named Lazarus. And we painted the picture of what's going on with Lazarus. Do I need to do that again? All right, I'll skip that. I got a page and a half to break that down.
this is a one point sermon, not just because of that role that it brought me, but the, the, how it was played. This was the thing that stood out to me and came to me in, in writing this, is that you may miss what you long for because it's too far below your potential. You may miss what you long for because it's too far below your potential. Your dream may not be big enough. See, all Lazarus could envision were crumbs. Not a slice, not a loaf, just crumbs. He never saw himself sitting at that table, and he never saw himself walking through those gates. All he could envision were crumbs. See, what you see for yourself is important. What you put your eyes on and seek after matters. The stories you tell yourself about yourself has determining qualities that you have to always check and test against your destiny. Not just against your current location and situation. I mean, most of us hear this story in cringe when we catch that the dogs lick Lazarus' sores, but we let all kinds of people come in close to us who repulse us or don't mean us any good. Is that really any different? I, I mean, we, we have a condition that attracts the undesirable, and we're not doing anything that will change the circumstances. So the dogs just keep licking. You work that out at home, okay? And you do plan to have some attention because of your low expectations. You accept it as gospel and begin to shape your identity around those circumstances. Start to believe this is enough. This is it. But let's be clear there are some societal, economic, and political obstacles set up to cause certain people to stumble and to ensure <laughs> some never ever get ahead. Back to that 37 cent. <laughs> But sometimes we do more to prop up those systems than we do to lift each other up and band together to begin to dismantle those systems. I mean, we talk about the harms and the ills of gentrification, but we still haven't sat down and talked about what it would mean for us to form a co-op and we start buying homes in the community or opening up our own businesses in the community. We just sit back and talk about how awful it is that everybody else is coming in and taking you didn't have to clap for that. It's still true. <laughs> I mean, what if we were more intentional about connecting with neighbors and knowing they intend to sell grandma's house? If we offer seminars on what it truly means to build generational wealth and how to manage property for the long haul versus getting that one big payout that we all know will be gone in less than five years. Now, I don't want to beat up on Lazarus because when we first encounter him in the story, he is down. You're not supposed to kick a man while he's down. But the comedian George Wallace says, could you tell me a better time? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. I just repeated what he said. What you looking at? are crumbs from the rich man's table. And when it's all said and done, the rich man does not give Lazarus any relief. Lazarus dies and is taken by the angels to be with Abraham, the father of the faith. This was a good thing for, for Lazarus. This was a great getting up born and the old, the sweet by and by, you know, the over yonder, across Chile, Jordan. This is all that stuff we've been singing about. Abraham is over there and Lazarus and all the misery that he experienced in this life, in the next life there he is, right there in the bosom of Abraham. Wow, look at Lazarus. And the rich man goes to this place 
you don't preach about it for the next four weeks. <laughs> Plagues, torment. Some of y'all would call it hell. And it's so bad for the rich man that he begs the Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in some water and to place it on his tongue so that he can find some relief. Do you know how arrogant you would have to be to be the rich man in hell and Lazarus over there with Abraham and you want Lazarus to leave where he is over in the comfort of Abraham to come over to dip his finger in the water and then to put it on your old nasty tongue so that you can get some relief even in hell? <laughs> so you don't think Lazarus even gets to enjoy it? person in the world and in the world to come. That's the different thinking you have. But I know there's nobody in here. Amen? Amen. <laughs> the rich man had not shown Lazarus any compassion in life and he didn't appear to be ready to show him any in death. Can you envision? 
living a life beyond the current image of your that your past has told you would be your future? Can you envision being the CEO or the owner? Where you rise up and do good in the world. For the world. Can you envision being in the presence of the angels? Where you are shown your greatest potential. Where you are shown to be faithful. Even when you did not have everything you wanted. Even after the dogs have done you in. Even after you forgave yourself for all that you put yourself through, can you see something different for yourself? After you stop comparing your life and your failures with other people, can you envision something greater for yourself? After you determine that who you are to be and to become will be greater than what your mama said or what you fully told you. means our get up and go won't be enough. So we have to dream bigger dreams for ourselves. I understand that life got you. I understand that daddy left. Yeah, that marriage didn't quite work out. Yeah, the rays didn't come through. <clears throat> yeah, you didn't expect it to be like this. Yeah, you, getting on your feet isn't like riding a bike. Yeah, staying ready doesn't always work for you as it does for others. Yeah, nest eggs sometimes break. And yeah, your best may not seem good enough. Yeah, your credit card debt may be excessive. Yeah, that frog never turned into the prince. Frog you brought home. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write those stories. I didn't read what I did. <laughs> Disney built an empire off that. And y'all bought it. Y'all believe it. Y'all take them frogs home and you just kiss on it and kiss on it. with what you have. Amen. 
in service to God and all of creation. And some of us are waiting for that great getting up morning. Some of us are waiting to get to heaven, to live right. But I believe what Jesus is pointing out as he tells this story is that you can't wait. Yes. Amen. If today is the day to be compassionate, then today is the day to be compassionate. Amen. If today is the day to feed the hungry, then today is the day that you feed the hungry. Yes. If today is the day that you know you need to get your attitude right, Then today is the day. What are you waiting for? Surely the rich man was eating, having a good time. And it's like, you know, when it's all over, I'll be with Abraham. Y'all say, last one's still out there? Pass me another bone. Here we go. Jesus tells this story. Lazarus lived longing for compassion and was taken away with the angels. The rich man lived the way he wanted to and ended up somewhere he didn't want to. <laughs> and we'll talk about that place in the next four weeks. Week one, we'll talk about the H. Week two, we'll talk about the E. Week three, we'll do the L. 